thank our panelists for that wonderful session. Can you give me another round of applause for them? Uh, we are, of course, behind because of this morning's uh, time frame, so unfortunately we didn't get a robust discussion, but um, hopefully we'll pick up along the way. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce to you someone you all may remember, but actually I remember because my father was U.S. military. He served in the Air Force, and in the, in the uh, early 80s, uh, we lived at Tinker, outside of Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Uh, Dell City, to be exact. And there was a superstar football player that everybody was talking about. And then later on, when I came to Washington, he was actually a, a member of the U.S. House of Representatives. His name is Congressman J.C. Watts. He's currently the chairman of uh, J.C. Watts Jr., excuse me. He's currently the chairman of the J.C. Watts Company, a multi-industry holding company headquartered in Washington, D.C. In this role, Congressman Watts provides strategic focus and program leadership, advising Fortune 500 companies and serving on the board of Dillard's uh, department stores. He's also worked successfully in major civil rights issues such as voting rights, and he's appeared often on news shows and is widely quoted in newspapers. So he served in Congress uh, in the 4th District from Oklahoma in 1994. Uh, where he served on a number of committees. But I actually remember him, I, when I worked on the Hill, uh, I worked for Congressman Rangel. And so, you know, Congressman Watts was a, a champion of things like the enterprise zones, empowerment zones, new markets tax credits. He actually was an advocate for leveraging public policy to actually make a difference, particularly around uh, urban develop, community development and revitalization. So it is actually my distinct honor and privilege uh, to welcome Congressman Watts to the stage. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Dr. Rockmore, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, you thinking enough of me to allow me to come this morning and share some of my thoughts and my ideas and my opinions. And um, I knew that uh, the summit was about to happen, and I called Dr. Rockmore and said, uh, I'd sure like to, to speak at, at the summit. And she said, well, you know, Congressman, I, I just don't think you're ready. And I, and I said, but, but my, I said, I served eight years in Congress, I, new markets tax credits, um, you know, enterprise zones, I, I said, uh, number four in leadership, she said, I, 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 Congressman, I just don't think you're ready. And, and so I called back about two weeks later and I said, Dr. Rockmore, I said, I want to speak at the summit so badly, I said, I'll do it free. She said, JC, I think you're ready. So, <laughs> so I am delighted to, to be here and, and, uh, and uh, to, be, to be a part of this. And, and uh, after she agreed to let me speak, I said, okay, now what do I speak about? She said, speak about 12 to 15 minutes and have a seat. So, I am gonna, gonna honor that, and, and, and I know we're running just a tad behind time, so hopefully I can give a little bit of time back. I don't know how many of you, and, and, and I suspect most of you in the room here about a um, month, month and a half ago, two months ago, you saw on your TV screen where at the University of Oklahoma, my alma mater, uh, from about 1976 through May of 1981, I attended University of Oklahoma graduated with a degree in journalism, uh, public relations, and, and as uh, Dr. Rockmore told you, I was, uh, was, on a, was a student athlete during my time at the University of Oklahoma. But here in the last couple of months, you all probably heard about this, uh, these young men or these fraternity students heading to a party at a country club in Oklahoma City who were singing racist songs. And of course that, you know, went viral and it went all over the world and, and uh, the University of Oklahoma was the center of attention concerning those racist songs. And about two days after the, the story went viral, well, the president at the University of Oklahoma announced that he was going to appoint a diversity director. And so I, about 24 hours later, I sent a a, an email to the president of the university and athletic director at the University of Oklahoma stating these facts. I said, you appointing a diversity director falls, rings hollow with me. 
I said, because think about these facts. The University of Oklahoma has no one on their Board of Regents that looks like me. The University of Oklahoma has very few, if any, uh, African-American vendors doing business with them throughout their university system where they spend millions of dollars every year. The University of Oklahoma has no one that looks like me helping to manage their endowment funds. And Mr. President, by the way, you have no one that looks like me on your staff. You have no one that looks like me who serve as deans at the University of Oklahoma. So, Mr. President, I hope you will not find fault in me in saying, again, that it rings hollow in you saying that you are going to appoint a diversity director. To this day, I still am looking for a response from the president of the University of Oklahoma to my, to my email. And I went on to say to him, finally, I said, maybe, I said, this is something that we have to consider. Are we fostering an environment at the University of Oklahoma that would encourage students to, to sing those type of songs? And I think that's the question that we have to ask in, 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 in America and, and, and in public policy, these United States of Opportunities. Are we doing things consciously or unconsciously that would foster an environment for some to be left out or to be left behind. I think there are several things, I think there's four things that I, that, uh, that I think are important things for wealth creation in our, in our ethnic minority communities. And I think it's important to foster and encourage these things. First, I think education, I, I think investment in education. And I will add an addendum to that to say that we have to invest in education that works. I think education is the foundation, obviously, that creates, that, that, that opens up the, the, the runway for these other three things to happen. Frederick Douglass said, some people know the importance of education because they have it. He said, I knew the importance of education because I didn't have it. And I think I mentioned, and, 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 and I'm I, I say to you that I think we have to invest in education that work. Public education, private education, private faith-based education, but I think we have to invest in education that work because that is the pillar that gives our kids, gives our grandkids the foundation, the infrastructure to go out and do the other things that I think are important for them to benefit their families and themselves. Home ownership. Jack Kemp, I'm, I'm an old Jack Kemp disciple, and Jack Kemp and I had discussions all the time about home ownership when he was the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, when he was the Secretary of HUD. And Jack had a philosophy. He said when people own, when they are owners, when they have ownership, they feel like they have a, a stake in the system, and they, they fight for the system, they fight for the neighborhoods, they, 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 they fight for the children, they, they, they fight to make sure that their neighborhoods are safe when they have ownership. When you give people ownership, and home ownership, I think, is, 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 is no question the largest investment that most people will have, that probably 70% of the American people will have in their lifetime. Home ownership. And in 2008, we saw a system that I rang the bell for probably seven or eight years saying that if ever there's a blip in the housing market, that there were two institu institutions by the name of Fannie, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, if ever there was a, a blip in the housing market, these two in institutions would destabilize the greatest economy in the world. Now, Republicans protected them. And, and they protected the investment bankers under the disguise of no new regulation. Democrats protected these institutions and the banking, the financial services industry under the guise of affordable housing. And at the end of the day, it, it tells you how bad the system was when you looked up and down the food chain and you saw greed and you saw corruption and neither side did anything about it, 
And in 2008, when we had the meltdown, eventually we had just two institutions. We had many institutions, but two institutions that paid $24 billion, not $24,000, not $24 million, but $24 billion in fines. No management went to jail. No board members lost their seats. But yet 70% of the American people who say that their home is the most, most important and the major investment in their lives, they get their credit turned upside down. They today can't, can't, can't qualify for, for more mortgage loans. Home ownership, we've got to get back to the basics of, of, of home ownership. I, you know, you, you, you've got, you would be surprised people with credit scores over 700 over 720, which is a good credit score, can't qualify for home loans today. And I refinanced my house about six months ago, and, and, and ironically, I had to jump through hoops that I thought, man, that, that, that fellow that, that, that's got a home, you know, $150,000, $200,000 a year that he's trying, he or she, they're trying to get refinanced, it is impossible to do. Credit scores, again, over 720. Their credit's been ruined. People being put in houses that, that they should have been paying $1,000 a month, and they were paying $2,500 a month. Knowing at the outset, if ever there's a blip in the housing market, it would destabilize the greatest economy in the world based on what was going on in the mortgage industry. Home ownership, critically important. Savings. You know, I, I, I find um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little different and, and, and probably a little bit um, you know, out of kilter with many of my colleagues that, that I serve with in the U.S. House of Representatives. But I don't believe we should tax savings. What, what, if, if I was king of the world, I would eliminate taxes altogether on those who make about $70,000, $75,000 or less. The only way that we can get ahead in America, there's only two ways to do it. And if you know another, let me know. Save or invest. Only way to get ahead, to create wealth. Either you save or you invest. Why do we tax savings? It is, it is a double tax. If you make $100 and you bring home a, a, a net of $70 a month and you say, I'm going to take $7 and I'm going to put it in savings, you've already been taxed on that. Why do we tax savings? And I would take it a step further. I was an advocate when I was in Congress to say, and, and this again, been an old Jack Kemp disciple, disciple, Jack and I talked about this many times. Welfare moms, welfare dads. They get penalized for saving money. We heard testimony in 1995 and 1996 that people would save money who were on welfare. They would save money, and, and the government would say to them, you've got to spend the savings before we reintroduce your benefits. If the only way to get ahead is to save or invest, why do we discourage it? I think we should encourage savings. And lastly is, is opportunity. Opportunity. J.C. Watts has been given much opportunity in my 57 years of living. I represent in my consulting business, I represent an organization called NASP, National, National Association of Security Professionals. It's an organization created or, or, or that, that's, um, that, that, that uh, institutionalizes uh, African-American securities professionals around the country. The Dodd-Frank bill, regardless of what you think about it, I disagree with much of what was in the Dodd uh, Frank Bill, but regardless of what you think about the Dodd-Frank Bill, there was a section of the bill that said you shall not maybe do this or we hope that you will do this. There was a section of the bill that said you shall 
create opportunities for ethnic minorities in terms of securities. We had been fighting tooth and toenail to get the National Association of Securities Professionals in the game, in the mix, to, to get a bigger piece of the pie in terms of securities, and not just in the private sector, but in the public sector, with the United States Treasury. If you look at what controls what comes into your house at night by way of television, there's probably about two or three, four companies that controls what, what we as Americans see. I've been trying to start a black television news channel for the last 10 years. Last 10 years. And you can't say that African American community says we don't want news. Three years ago, 88% of the community said, we want news that's culturally specific to us. Today, over 91% of the African American community says, we want news that's culturally specific to us. You say, JC, what do you mean that's culturally specific to the black community? Well, let me give you just a little simple example. Culturally, and I was a youth pastor once at a, at a white church. And at Thanksgiving time, we'd have a church-wide dinner, a community-wide dinner. And we'd have red, yellow, brown, black, and white people that, that, that would come and, and, uh, and, and, and participate in our Thanksgiving dinner. We used it as an outreach, as a ministry, to, to share the gospel with people. So people would come, and, and my pastor couldn't figure out why most of the black community was not eating the pumpkin pie. And I said, Pastor, culturally, we'll show up at the Thanksgiving dinner, but culturally, most of us eat sweet potato pie. So that's culturally specific. So again, if you want to talk about Thanksgiving dinner, if you're watching CNN or, or Fox or MSNBC and you're talking about Thanksgiving dinner and you're talking about pumpkin potato chips, pumpkin dressing, that doesn't move me. Now you're talking about Sweet potato chips? Sweet potato chips that taste like dressing? Now you're talking to me. So th that's, that's, just, that's just a simple illustration. Doesn't mean that we can't eat together. It just means I, I, don't, I don't eat that. I, I, I eat sweet potato pie. So opportunity. You look at any space existing today in America. Defense, we spend billions of dollars every year in the aerospace industry. Very few minorities get contracts in the aerospace industry. We've got over 10% of, 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 of the U.S. military who are African American, and if you have the Hispanic community, it puts us well over 20%. But yet African Americans get less than 1% of the contracts. I had this conversation over 10 years ago with the aerospace industry, and, and they said, well, you know, we, 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 do, we do about as well as most. I said, you say that to encourage me, but you discourage me, because most don't do well either. The tech industry, financial services industry, opportunity. My philosophy has always been, just give me a chance. Doesn't even have to be a fair chance. Just give me a chance. And if we are educating our young people, if we are creating home ownership opportunities in, 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 in America, if we are encouraging as opposed to discouraging saving, and we open the door for opportunity for everybody, not just for some, not just for some, but everybody. Friends, we will lessen the wealth gap in these United States of America. Thank you very much for letting me come.